everyone, Eric Salahub here, and this is a screencast version of why we lecture and why we shouldn't. I am going to move quickly since this is a lecture about why not to lecture, um, and just encourage you to reach out to me or any of your instructional coaches if this intrigues you, if you found it provocative, if you want to talk about lecturing or why not to, or anything that comes up um, from watching this WebEx, um, just let me know. So um, I'm going to be doing a lot of talking for the next hour or so. In fact, um, like any good lecturer, I will look at the 90 slides I have and see how fast I have to click to get through the content. Um, I know that you will only get anything meaningful out of this if you do critical thinking and active learning in your head um, while you're watching this. Take notes, and since this is a video, uh, feel free. This is the best kind of lecture. It's when you can pause, you can rewind, you can replay it, you can watch it on your phone. Um, so be as active as possible. Uh, when I do ask you to stop and think and write, there's no chat to actually participate in, but definitely do stop and think. Hit pause. Um, if you want to get the most out of this, have a pad and paper or a laptop handy and take some notes. Those are my students, by the way, from a previous semester. Um, that's them writing, thinking, and making connections. Um, that's what learning looks like. So are you a lecturer? You're here for some reason. Um, I haven't defined the lecture yet, but are you one? And to what extent? Um, rate yourself on a scale of 0 to 10. Um, and again, there's no chat, but think about it. Lots of different things we might call lecture. I'm just offering three as food for thought for today. Uh, I'll hit, hit you with one more later. Um, we've got what I'm calling continuous exposition by the teacher. Um, you know what this looks like. It's what I'm doing now. I'm going to talk um, for an entire hour. I'm going to show you visuals. Um, if I were in a classroom, I might be working problems or doing other things on the board. Um, but this is when the teacher is talking all the time, or almost all the time, doing all the work. We've got this lecture discussion, which I know you're familiar with. Um, certainly lecture as storytelling is something that we might be doing. And so keep these in the back of your head as you're thinking about what it means to lecture and whether you are one or not. And so you can really think about those three types continuous exposition, lecture discussion, and storytelling. Does that capture what you do that you called lecture? And if not, what else are you doing that you're calling lecture or that might be lecture? The other thing you can think about in the background as we're talking is what are the commonalities of different types of lectures? Um, and we'll get there too. So I'm a philosopher, or I like to call myself a philosophy teacher and not a philosopher. Um, but as I was pondering this, and I've been thinking about lectures and active learning for many years now, um, well, this was clearly someone I studied about in college, um, Socrates, and he didn't lecture. Um, you know, that's who the Socratic method's named after. Um, Socrates did not lecture why not? There was actually a time before the lecture, and um, I guess we've got to go back, uh, well, this is more than 2,000 years ago. And so I want to introduce you to what I'm going to call the knowledge transmission paradigm, uh, the TKP. Um, this is the current paradigm of teaching and learning. It's the paradigm that's been around for a long time, not as far back as Socrates. He existed before this knowledge transmission paradigm. This is where we are. It's where we are. It's where our institutions are. Some of us are moving out of this paradigm, but I want to let you know that in order to understand why we lecture, we have to come to grips with this knowledge transmission paradigm. Um, where teachers are the content experts, and they mainly stay at the front of the room dispensing knowledge to students, Students' job is to be passive, to sit out there, look at the teacher, take notes, record, um, and um, absorb information. And in general, the knowledge transmission paradigm is focused on facts, content, and topics. It's not all it cares about, but I want to just paint this initial picture for you and let you know that this is the dominant uh, paradigm of teaching and learning. It's what informs all of us and our students, our institutions, our supervisors, our peers, and everything else. And so uh, I think this paradigm is rather invisible, 
because it is so profound that we simply don't realize that we're in it or how powerful it is or that there's another option. And what I want to do today is just go for the heart of the dragon. Um, if I want to, in some sense, attack this knowledge transmission paradigm, which I do, um, more as a provocateur and to get you thinking, um, we have to realize that you may or may not consider yourself a lecturer, but if you're a part of this current paradigm, then um, you know most of the work is being done by you, and the lecture is the hallmark trait of the knowledge transmission paradigm. And so, um, you know, that dragon can breathe fire, and it's really tempting for that dragon to breathe fire. And so um, when I go for the lecture, it's not because I want to get rid of the lecture. I would encourage you to think about getting rid of some or all of your lecturing, but I am not worried that anything I do or that we do will harm the lecture or harm this paradigm. So I'm going to go for it and attack this dragon and invite you to entertain the idea that lectures may not be the best thing you can be doing in class. And so we have this knowledge transmission paradigm, which I know you're familiar with. Um, and then we've got this other newer paradigm. Uh, it's been around for a while too, but paradigm shifts take a long time. Um, people have at least been talking about this paradigm for a hundred years. I'll show you some quotes, um, maybe a couple hundred years. Um, it asks teachers to stop dispensing knowledge and instead facilitate learning, to design classes where students learn, um, but not to consider their focus on transmitting knowledge by a lecture or any other way. This new paradigm requires students to move from their passive role and take responsibility for learning. And that primarily means realizing that the teacher can't learn for them, that they need to do the work, they need to do the homework, they need to come to class ready to learn. And while facts, content, and topics are clearly still really important, the active learning paradigm is going to ask us to focus more on outcomes and skills. And so this is not a WebEx about active learning per se, but I want you to understand these two paradigms because it'll frame our conversations about lectures and about moving away from lectures. So why didn't Socrates lecture? Uh, well, he didn't lecture because he didn't think he knew anything. Um, he at least said, I know nothing. Uh, I know more than most people because they think they know something when they don't. Uh, I at least know that I'm ignorant. And um, I I'm not being facetious here. Um, Socrates didn't think he had anything to lecture on. He did not think philosophy was a topic of study, but instead an activity. It wasn't a set of facts. It wasn't a set of content or topics. It was literally a set of skills uh, that he encouraged people to participate in. And so Socrates engaged people in conversation, but he really wanted them to do the work, and he thought of himself as a learner facilitator, although those are my words and not his. Um, but, you know, not too long after Socrates, we get this. Um, and this looks a lot like a lecture. And so we get um, a church, uh, I think this is clearly a priest, um, an archbishop, I guess, and that looks like a lecture. And the lecture really makes sense in this context. You have someone uh, who has a direct line to important knowledge that these people sitting out there, the students don't have. Without the lecturer and without the content, um, the students can't do anything on their own. And so this gives you a sense of what is going on in a lecture. This is the transmission of knowledge from expert, sage on the stage, to students. And so the word lecture itself, of course, comes from the Latin to read. And, um, you know, the, we, this, the word lecture started getting used in the West, I don't know, 1300s. Um, by the 1500s, it was used in the current sense, right? Um, a teacher standing in front, reading and presenting to students. And so lecture literally means to read, and lecturers were readers. And in fact, if you are to, you know, go to the Chronicle of Higher Ed or look at job announcements from Australia, 
or England, you will actually see they're not looking for instructors, they're looking for readers. Um, that's still what they call that particular, you know, maybe it's uh, not an assistant professor, but it's a reader. A reader in philosophy. Um, you know, it's the person who reads the book. And so here we have mid 14th century um, Italian lecture. And here we have, um, well, there's one book and the person's reading it. And there are people transcribing and copying that book. And so when there's one book, lectures really make sense because there's knowledge to transmit. And now transmitting that knowledge and those facts to students who don't have the book, this is before the printing press, after all, really important. If you wanted the knowledge, you needed to find someone who had it and listen to it. Um, I guess I will let you ponder this and realize that even in the mid 14th century, we had people gabbing in the back row and we had people sleeping through the lecture. And so not a lot has changed in 700 years. And I'm going to call this a lecture. It is an anatomy demonstration from 1609. And again, if you are interested in anatomy um, and you don't want to go grave robbing, this is probably a great way to get the basic information about anatomy. Um, I will just point out that as I was looking uh, at this picture and thinking about it, I teach at Front Range Community College, Larimer Campus in Fort Collins, Colorado, and my community college students actually have a cadaver lab on campus. And so I'm sure their teacher, uh, my friend, um, does actually do a few demonstrations, but uh, the 200 level anatomy students are actually doing their own dissections of cadavers. And so um, keep that in mind as some context for thinking about the history of lecturing. Well, Socrates didn't lecture, but we've been lecturing pretty much ever since then, and we're still doing it. And I guess the question is, why? Why do we still lecture? Um, well, take a moment. You know, conjure a mental image um, right now of a classroom with students and a teacher. If you were a kid um, and you played school, um, what were the roles? And what did those people do? And I only ask you to do this to give you a little pause to recognize how entrenched the current paradigm of teaching and learning is. I'm pretty sure that your mental image had uh, a teacher at the front, students looking at the teacher, um, and if not, it was probably something close to that. And certainly if you didn't conjure that image, maybe you conjured a lab setting or something, I think you get what I'm saying here. This image of the teacher as the purveyor of information and students out there as more passive um, is so prominent, it is really hard to think about anything else. And so again, let's keep these types of lecture in the background and let's go ahead and focus on this continuous exposition for a while. Um, even if you're not doing it for the whole 50 minutes or 75 minutes or three hours that you have, you know, when you go on that, um, you know, when you're presenting content, when you're showing PowerPoint slides, um, when you're going over material, um, that's what you're doing. And let's just keep this in mind as we think about um, some of these reasons to lecture and some of the maybe critiques of those reasons. And so we've got a whole bunch of reasons to consider. Um, I will send you some documents if you want them that'll have the citations for all of these quotes that I'm going to give you. Um, and so the one, the slides with the blue backgrounds are reasons we lecture. I'm not arguing that all of these are good reasons, but these are all reasons that I've either read or heard um, and I think we should take a look at. Um, so why do we lecture? Lectures are what teachers do. Um, being a great teacher simply means being a great lecturer. A content expert who presents information and different, demonstrates skills uh, to students. Why do I lecture? It's my job to lecture. I'm a teacher. That's what I do. And so if we had a chat, I would ask you to use the chat, but since we don't, um, just think about, does this reason resonate for you? And maybe that means it's a plus, or it doesn't resonate with you. You don't do it. You don't think this is a good reason. You see a lot of reasons or counter arguments. Maybe it's a negative and that little squiggle in the middle. I don't know. Maybe you're just kind of in the middle on it or considering it, or it's got some merits, but you're not sure. And so, why am I asking you to do this? I really want you to think about these reasons and be mentally engaged. And so, I don't know, give it a thumbs up, thumbs down, or a neutral. Um, that's what you do as a teacher. 
And so just to paint this uh, picture a little more clearly, look at your classroom. Um, it's got a front. It's got students looking at you. It probably has a whiteboard or chalkboard, smart board even in the front with a data projector. So your PowerPoint is showing so all students can look at it. If you've got publisher resources, it is more than likely that they are content and the intent is uh, this, these are resources to help you present information to students. And if you look at your course catalog, at least if uh, you're part of the community college system in Colorado and every university I've ever worked at, um, there are lecture courses, LEC. In fact, my discipline philosophy is a lecture discipline. And so our courses are literally, they're called lecture courses, LEC. Um, that's pretty much telling us what we do. My course meets Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 to 9.50. It's an LEC course, which means that it meets for 50 minutes, three times a week. Um, and guess what? I'm supposed to lecture in there. And maybe you teach a biology course or welding or EMS, um, chemistry, uh, dental hygiene. It's probably a LEC slash LAB. Well, that's telling you what, there's a lab portion of the course where your students are doing the work. And then there's the lecture portion where you're dumping all the content into their heads. And so um, just to give you a sense of how ingrained, again, lectures are in this concept of the role of lectures in the knowledge transmission paradigm. Um, lectures are what we do because our supervisors and our peers, um, that's what they expect. And our supervisors are evaluating me, judging me. My peers are respecting me because I'm a great content expert, right? That's what I do. And so that's why I lecture. And this is clearly a significant reason for many people. I work with many part-time faculty, and if your department chair tells you to lecture and that person makes the choice of whether to hire you back or not, then um, there's this is a really good motivation, even if it's not tied to student learning. So I don't know how well this reason resonates for you. If you have tenure, um, then maybe uh, you don't care what your supervisors think, uh, or maybe you have um, a thick skin and you maybe have your reputation and it's okay uh, that your peers think what you're doing in class is crazy once you stop lecturing. Um, but you may be working with colleagues or part-time faculty, and for them, this may be a really powerful reason. We might lecture because it's our identity as teachers. Our role models were lecturers. Pretty much every teacher you ever had, from your worst teacher to your best teacher, probably was a lecturer. Um, that's how you demonstrate your content expertise. You spent four years or eight years or however many years in college or in grad school learning to be a content expert and to learn all these skills. And man, what you do in the front of the classroom, that's where you actually get to show the students what, who you are. Um, I spent all this time, I'm going to show you my skills. Um, it also gives you power and control. Uh, for some of us, that is an explicit thing that we cultivate in the classroom, um, either because we like power or because we like control. And even if we say we don't like it, it comes with the job. And so that issue of power and control is very likely to be part of your identity. Um, you are the sage on the stage and you know I even though I try not to be a lecturer anymore man that uh, sage on the stage is something I used to put a lot of cachet to um, I'm going to encourage you to become a learner facilitator and I have to say I'm not sure that sounds like a promotion look we have egos and I've had some colleagues that have flat out told me because we've been friends for 20 years, you know, I like lecturing because it's about me and I don't want to be a learner facilitator because that's a demotion. They liken, and I used to as well, a learner facilitator is like a TA. No, it's worse than a TA. A TA at least is a teaching assistant. A learner facilitator is like uh, someone who works over in the remedial student uh, learning lab right? Uh, they're not even a teacher. They're just a student learner facilitator. And I hope you can hear the lilting in my voice. Um, I have come to believe that being a learner facilitator is what to, um, you know, the identity to desire. Um, and that is the kind of self-actualization to aspire to. 
Um, but it does mean that you have to realize it's not about you. What you do is extremely important, but the class is about the student. And so um, whether you admit it or not, and maybe it's not true of you, but there is a big part of your ego that is probably tied up with being in the front of the room. Um, this is a tough one. I had my own identity crisis and started about five years ago. Uh, I've been co-teaching with a colleague, Carrie Mitchell, for more than 10 years, meaning we're sitting in each other's classes all the time, co-teaching classes. And uh, we had taught together for many years. And one day I was gone and I didn't get a sub because even though she's an English teacher, um, she had taken my ethics class many times because she'd sat through it. Uh, and I mean sat through it literally um, as a lecturer. She got to hear my lectures many times. So, you know, I thought she could facilitate this activity that I designed. Normally I would do my lecture, but I created something and she ran this while I was at a conference. And I came back and Carrie was so excited to tell me, Eric, um, you know, hope you had a good conference, man. That was the best class ever. You know, the students learned more. We had a great time. Um, and she really thought they learned more. And, you know, we laughed about it, but this really bugged me for a while. Um, a couple of years later, we co-designed an online class. We had taught online independently for many years, each of us, but we co-designed. This is the first time I actually designed a class from the ground up. And um, this is the best class that either of us have ever had ever taught. Um, our students did better. Um, and of course, we realized as online teachers, there is no lectures. And so, that epiphany of when I'm gone and Carrie was facilitating a workshop in class where the students were doing the work and she was simply facilitating because she wasn't an expert um, and my students learned so much and then they learned more in my online class when we planned it really carefully. Um, I definitely have had my identity uh, crisis and it's still happening. Um, I am a, trying to become a non-lecturer. So we are still in this knowledge transmission paradigm. That's why we're having these identity crises. And again, I just want to focus you on if you're lecturing, it's probably because you find value in the facts, the content, and the topics of your course. That's the stuff that's in the textbook. It's probably what's on those PowerPoint slides that you designed or that the publisher gave you. Uh, it's what you talk about. It's what you write on the board. It's not the only thing that matters, but we spend a lot of time, if we're lecturing, focused on transmitting knowledge to students, and that knowledge comes in the form of facts, content, and topics. And so there is a lot of content in our classes, and one of the reasons we lecture is because we want students to learn, and we know they need the content, and we think that covering it in class through lecture is a good way to help students learn. It's the way to get through the material and to get the point across. And you can go ahead and think about, is this a good reason? Is it your reason? Do you think this is a common reason that other people lecture? Do you not like this reason? Are you neutral on it? And so, you know, I think you know what I mean by covering content. This, these are the phrases we hear all the time. Um, I got to go to class today and get through the material. I've got a lot of content to cover. Um, I'm showing PowerPoint slides and I'm already looking at the clock. I'm 23 minutes in and I'm only on slide 30. I've got to cover faster. Um, I'm working problems. The students have a whole bunch of problems. I'm going to demonstrate. I'm going to work a whole bunch of problems for them. I'm going to give examples. I'm going to tell stories. I'm going to do the work. I'm going to transmit knowledge to the students. And we do it because we think the content is important and the students aren't reading it on their own. We might have assigned the reading, we might have expected them to study, uh, but they're not coming to class ready. They're not learning the content outside of class, and so since they need to learn it, we give it to them in class. Um, they are incapable of doing it outside of class, or if they're capable, they're unwilling. Um, and I wonder how this rings to you. Um, they aren't doing the reading. Um, they're passing their eyes over the the text. They're not doing critical reading. They're not actually taking their homework seriously. They're going through the motions. They're doing the minimum if they do it at all. Um, I love this quote from Samuel Johnson. I think it's about 1750. Um, there were people pushing back against the knowledge transmission paradigm even more than 300 years ago. Um, well, 250 years ago. 
Um, lectures were once useful, Johnson says, but now when all can read and books are so numerous, lectures are unnecessary. Lectures made a heck of a lot of sense when there's one book. But now books are ubiquitous. Uh, E-texts, online texts, online videos, Khan Academy. I can pretty much search for any topic on any discipline and find innumerable lectures, uh, journal articles, library databases. Um, students do definitely have access to the content in various forms outside of class. Um, so why are we still lecturing? So do lectures actually drive the learning of content? If we're lecturing about content, then we must think it's a good way to, for students to learn that content, and I will tell you that Graham's, Graham Gibbs agrees with you. Um, in his book, uh, 20 Terrible Reasons to Lecture, which I'll talk about later, uh, he does note in his reading of the research that um, there is no significant difference between lecturing and a host of other methods in their ability to enable students to learn factual material. Um, if you want to take a note on something, this is probably the only one of the only positive things I'm going to say about lecturing from the research. It may be just as good as other methods at getting students to learn factual material. Um, it, it's as effective, but not more effective than lots of other methods. Um, but Gibbs did find one method in the research that looked better, and that's unsupervised reading. And so. I'm going to go ahead and just give you a concession. Covering the material in a lecture is probably as good as if your students would have just read it at home. And so maybe we should think about getting students to do their reading. And if they're in class, they also have this problem. It's really hard to pay attention for very long. And I tried to vet this graph that I saw all over the internet, and it actually came from research from um, Benjamin Bloom, um, but I couldn't find his citation. And so I read, you know, there's some variability here. There are strategies and tactics, and some people can maybe pay attention slightly longer than 10 or 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Some people have less than this. Um, so there are variables, but I will just say attention span is limited. And if you're lecturing for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 40 minutes, and I was just talking to colleagues um, that lecture for multiple hours, so you have a three hour class, and this is in biology, this is in uh, nursing, this is in many classes. And so um, the human brain has a capacity to pay attention and it's limited. And I'll just say, keep that in the background as you're thinking about how long you're talking. Uh, I'm keeping it in mind because I've been talking now for 27 minutes, and so you're somewhere down here. Now, you're here for a reason. You, you're bringing intrinsic motivation. You're a teacher. You already have a lot of information about lectures, and so hopefully you're doing some critical thinking. I'm trying to be challenging, maybe to get your blood pressure up a little bit, um, get you to want to disagree with me and argue, um, to, to help you pay attention but I realize that this is a difficulty. Well, Dr. James Lang in his book, Small Teaching says, you know, lectures, no matter how good they are, can only attend to low level outcomes. And what does he mean? I'm sure you know what he means. He's talking about Bloom's taxonomy. Um, lectures can only hope to attend very well to facts and concepts that you want students to memorize or spit back at you, or maybe they are explanations of ideas, they're, they're you know, your attempt to, to uh, describe or identify. Um, I am not arguing that people don't think or try to attend to these higher level outcomes through lectures, um, but Lang says lectures are generally attending to the facts and the content of the discipline. And Low level doesn't mean bad. Low, it's really, really important that students have the ability to recall important facts uh, and to understand uh, important facts and concepts and topics about your discipline. But they're low level in that most of us think that those are building blocks for higher level, more important skills. So um, you may have heard of Eric Mazur, Dr. Eric Mazur, a physics professor from Harvard, 
where he currently teaches, and um, this is a video that he has on YouTube called Confessions of a Converted Lecturer. In fact, I just saw an article yesterday, on Sunday, I'm doing this on Monday morning, um, where Mazur was interviewed and a journalist quotes him as saying, um, if you're still lecturing, you're unethical. So, um, you know, I think if Mazur were listening, he would be nodding right along with me. Um, Dr. Mazur um, lectures pre-med students in physics, used to, and he is now a converted lecturer. He does uh, teach in large quote-unquote lecture halls at Harvard, uh, but he does not call himself a lecturer anymore. So one of the reasons is um, Mazur's pre-med students, uh, this is going back several years, uh, you know, he covered the concept of Newtonian mechanics in his physics class for pre-med students at Harvard, and he thoroughly covered these Newtonian mechanics concepts and assumed that his students understood them. Now they could, they passed the exams. They did really well um, working the formulas uh, and passing the exams, but when he questioned them about the conceptual understanding of Newtonian mechanics, they didn't understand it. And this really bothered him as someone teaching future doctors. He wanted them to have the critical thinking and to be able to actually do more than work problems. And so this bugged him a lot. And so this really, he's agreeing that this, the lectures were attending to the low level outcomes, but they weren't helping students get where he wanted them to go. I also will really point you to this quote from Dr. Mazur. He says that in a traditional lecture paradigm, this knowledge transmission paradigm, we spend all of our time in the classroom transmitting knowledge, which he says is the easy part, which it, it is. It, it's not easy, but it's the easiest part of learning is memorizing the facts. Um, but then he says what well, we leave it to the students to actually assimilate the information uh, and, and be able to do something with it. We want them to do that at home. Uh, he says what well, most of the actual learning happens outside the classroom. They come to class, they take the notes, and then we expect them to go home and do the hard work of applying those facts and doing something. Um, I don't know. You've got a lot of work you do outside of class, and you're probably expecting students to study two to three hours outside of class for every hour in class, and you only have a very limited amount of precious time with your students. And I think Dr. Mazur is asking us how important are those facts? And I mean, they are really important for students to get, but are they so important that I'm going to spend, or he might say waste, our precious time together in class doing the easy part? when he's clearly suggesting students can do the easy part out here. Um, so let's move on. Let's see if I get my slides right. Um, we've talked about facts. What about skills? Well, there, there's content, but you think there are probably, you probably think there are skills that are important for your class too. Um, they need to take that content and do something with it. They need to think critically about it. They need to reflect on it. They need to analyze and synthesize, evaluate. They need to create. They need to communicate. They need to write effectively or speak effectively. They need to problem solve. You know, I know I'm talking to people from a wide variety of disciplines, but they all have higher level outcomes than memorizing. Unless you're teaching anatomy uh, or medical terminology, it might simply be memorizing. It might be memorizing a thousand prefixes and suffixes and terms. And that may be a class focused on extremely important, quote unquote, low level outcomes. But even in a medical terminology class, there's probably something a little bit more than that, uh, critical thinking. Um, we lecture because we know there are important skills and we want students to learn those skills and so we lecture about them. What do you think of this reason? This is a good reason to lecture because we know we want students to be critical thinkers and effective communicators and problem solvers. And I'm going to help them become critical thinkers and problem solvers and communicators um, by lecturing. And I work with people in every discipline. So when I talk to my welding faculty and my auto um, faculty, I wonder, do they think that lecturing about how to change a spark plug is actually going to help a student change a spark plug or something? Maybe so. Um, this is the same bloom, by the way, that 
did Bloom's taxonomy. He did a whole bunch of research in memory and learning beyond Bloom's taxonomy. And he said when he did research on what's actually going on in students' heads while they're in a lecture, um, well, they're not doing a lot of critical thinking. Um, what are they actually doing while you're lecturing? 78% um, of their time they're spent on passive thoughts about the subject or irrelevant thoughts. Only 1% of the time uh, is actually spent on what we might call critical thinking. And even if he was wrong by a factor of 10, it's still not very likely that your students are doing a lot of high level thinking during your lecture. And if you think differently, um, well, let's talk about that. One of my heroes is Dr. Terry Doyle. He wrote a book in 2011 called Learner-Centered Teaching. It's one of the things that sparked my interest in what I'm calling active learning. Um, I love this quote, the person who does the work does the learning. I think what Dr. Doyle would say is every time you demonstrate critical thinking and problem solving in front of the class, you're becoming a better critical thinker and problem solver because you're doing a lot of work. Um, your students are passive and so they're not doing much work and if Doyle's quote is right then you leave that lecture having learned and gotten better and your students not so much. He says if you want students to learn they need to actually use and apply the course content by thinking creatively and critically. Um, they need to utilize the content. Um, they need to do the work. Uh, Dr. James Lang, he's the author of Small Teaching, says you can't fire the synapses in your students' brains for them. Um, as much as you want to make connections for students, you can't. Uh, making connections is great. Coming up with examples is great. Um, it helps you learn, but you can't do it for your student. Um, your students need connections. They need practice, but they need to do it. And so Lang is suggesting that your job is not to do the critical thinking, but to set up a situation where students are forced to do the critical thinking and the communicating and problem solving. Um, Bly wrote a book um, going back, I don't know, 20, more than 20 years. What's the use of lectures? I'm going to quote from it several times. I'll talk more about it later. Um, and he says that in his entire book on um, what's the use of lectures, and guess what, spoiler alert, Bly doesn't think there is any use for lectures. Um, he could not track down a single study which found that lectures are more effective than another method for promoting thought. If you want to promote thought, it is not the case, according to Bly, that lectures are better than anything else. Um, in fact, he found 21 studies which found lectures to be less effective than discussion or reading or individual work in class. And so if that's true, it is certainly a counter argument against demonstrating critical thinking as a way to teach critical thinking. Um, Bly says the best way to learn to solve problems is to be given problems that have to be solved. The best way to awaken critical thinking skills is to practice using the canons of criticism. And I love this quote. It should be remembered that some people place faith in their lectures to stimulate thought and expect thinking skills to be absorbed like some mystical vapors from an academic atmosphere. And his facetiousness is bleeding through. He clearly thinks that this is fantasy. Um, Critical thinking skills are not absorbed when you demonstrate them. And let's go back to my new friend, uh, Samuel Johnson, just because I love um, his provocateur nature. You cannot, by all the lecturing in the world, enable a, a man to make a shoe. Um, <laughs> um, I think he's right. There are important facts in shoemaking that a shoemaker would need to learn. but. How do you learn to make shoes? Um, by apprenticing and probably making some really bad shoes the first couple of tries. So let's shift gears a little bit and move away from the continuous exposition to talk about lecture discussion. Just because I know a lot of you are going to say, all right, fine. Lect that Just talking to students and expecting them to absorb content or skills isn't going to work. But that's not what I do. I do this. I do this thing called lecture discussion, which is really an act, an active and engages students and it involves students. And so this is where 
you're probably still doing a lot of the talking because that's the lecture part and even in the discussion part you're probably answering questions and facilitating but you're taking questions asking questions um, and so you're trying to get people involved and so first I'll just ask you let's be honest is there as much difference between these two things as you think or is this distinction really disingenuous and a way for us to distance ourselves from something we know is bad and do something that we can at least tell ourselves is better and so maybe this is not the case but again I am trying to you know uh, stretch you and push you to think and so um, I could not help but put a picture from Ferris Bueller's Day Off in here. Um, I know that this has happened to you or you've seen it. This quote-unquote lecture discussion where the lecturer simply pauses and hopes a student will fill in the blank to his lecture. Um, anyone? Anyone? Can you tell me what I'm looking for? I'm lecturing and I'm going to pause so you can fill in the blank that I would have said, then I'm going to say anyway because no one is going to answer my question. And I call this call and response lecturing. It is a, a fake discussion in that sense. Um, now, students are actually recalling and anticipating the word or the phrase that you want, so I don't mean it's totally negative or bad, but it's not really asking for a bunch of independent thinking on the students' parts if all they're doing is filling in the blanks of the lecture that you were given. Uh, it's clearly still your attempt to transmit knowledge to students. You're just allowing students to, to say a few words uh, that you would have said anyway. And I guess I'll ask, who's really doing the work in the lecture discussion? How much of the time are you talking? How much of the emphasis is on you? How much of the power is on you? How much are different students actually participating? Um, I think there's just a paradox here with the lecture discussion um, because it has two competing goals. In as much as a lecture is an attempt for you to transmit knowledge to students because they didn't do the homework, you know they need the content, but they didn't come to class with the content. That's why you're lecturing about it. And then you're going to weave in this discussion part. And in order to discuss, students actually have to have a sufficient currency with the content in order to do something with it. And so we're really putting students in a bind, right? Because we're lecturing because we don't think they already have the content, and so we're lecturing about it. They're getting the content there. And then we're asking them to process it and do something with it spontaneously in the moment. Um, I think that's a high bar for a student, a high, high cognitive bar for students to pass. They're getting new information that maybe they've never heard about before, and you're expecting them to be able to answer a meaningful question or generate a meaningful question um, on the spot. Now, some students will be able to do it, and most won't. And I guess maybe I already said this, but I mean, think about it. The maximal discussion would have no lecture. It's all about discussion. But the maximal lecture has no discussion. And so if your goal is to transmit knowledge, every time a student jumps in, it's taking away from that goal. And if your goal is to foster meaningful discussion, every time you're trying to transmit knowledge, you're taking away from that goal. And so any lecture discussion is uh, competing with itself. And so, you know, if we really want the lecture to be about students gaining the content, I don't know how we can expect students to be good at the discussion part. Those that can participate meaningfully must have done the homework, whether you assigned it or not, right? They either had pre-existing knowledge or they studied and they're ready to come and have that meaningful discussion. They don't need the lecture, right? So they're probably bored during the lecture part. And then when they actually have the discussion, the questions they ask or the comments they make are over the heads of most of your other students who didn't do the homework. Now, some of them are going to try to participate, too, because you're giving points for participation. And what happens then? They're either asking questions or making comments that are out of ignorance uh, or their questions or comments are tangential at best. And so you're struggling to tie it back in. And so 
you know, what do you do with that? You get some students that have these great things that you'd really like to talk about if it was a graduate seminar, but 80% of your students don't understand what they're saying. And then some of your students are ignorant or just trying to participate and talk about things they don't understand, and that's really tough too. And then your, you know, quote unquote smart students are rolling their eyes. And then a lot of students are just sitting there. They're not participating much, um, if at all. And so I know this isn't a pretty picture of the lecture discussion, um, but I want to offer you a lesson from online learning. I spend a lot of my time on online learning. Um, this happened to me, and as an online instructional coach, I saw it happen all the time to my colleagues. They would have discussions, and they would be so frustrating and unproductive and horrible. Um, because either students wouldn't participate, or they would get in there, and they would go off on tangents, and they would give wrong answers, and, you know, the discussions just weren't working. And so, you know, I can't go into that too much here. I'll just say this. Um, one of the reasons students struggle in online discussion is because they're talking they're talking about things they don't understand. And so that requires a ton of work on the instructor's part to police all of the misinformation. And so, you know, I'll just suggest that once I implemented a quizzing to mastery scheme into my online class as a prerequisite for the discussions, my discussions became um, night and day. Um, students now in my class have to earn 100% on a reading quiz before the discussion starts. That does not mean they totally understand everything. They still have a lot of problems. But they have a minimum required currency with the material so that the discussions can start out productively. Um, if those students took seven attempts at a quiz to get 100%, they know that there are things they don't understand. And so they raise those questions in discussion. Uh, or they're tentative about their proclamations about those things in discussion. And so I'll only suggest that what's true of online learning is true of face-to-face -face classes too. I always tell people in online learning, do not mix an open discussion and you know some place where you want students to get the right answer together. And I'm gonna say it's the same thing in your class. It's one of the reasons lecture discussions can seem so chaotic is because the people participating uh, come with a vastly different set of levels of preparedness. So why do we lecture? Well, a lot of us lecture because we tell students to study, they come to class unprepared. Well, they need the content and so we lecture instead of doing what we might have done otherwise. And then we're really, what, creating this codependency where uh, students realize, I know Eric said to study, but he did, clearly didn't expect me to study because he let me off the hook and lectured. And so then students don't study because we know we're going to lecture anyway, and we create this really vicious negative cycle. And I don't think we should be surprised that students aren't studying or studying effectively. Um, most teachers do not understand evidence-based teaching and learning strategies, why would we think our students do? Some of them aren't studying because they've studied and they don't find it effective. Some of them are studying and they're implementing extremely ineffective strategies and so they're wasting their time or making very little uh, meaningful progress on learning because uh, they don't know what they're doing. Um, and so, you know, what we need to do is we need to force students to study effectively and I'm going to tell you the way to do that is to design homework intentionally that doesn't leave it open uh, so they have to guess for themselves. Um, if we understand what they should be doing for studying, uh, we can simply be explicit about it. Uh, it's one thing we can do. Uh, I mentioned quizzes to mastery. I use them in all my classes and I think they can be used in any class that there is content. Uh, ask your students to read the content watch the video, whatever the content is, to participate, acquire it, expose themselves to it, and then take quizzes. And I'm talking about quizzes in a learning management system. Um, and what do they do? They take a quiz. Um, they get some of them right and some of them wrong. Um, the ones that they get wrong, they have to go back and look at the reading again, and they have come and re-quiz. There's lots of different ways to do it. It can be the same quiz every time. It can be different quizzes every time. But the goal is that they use this as a self-assessment for the basic knowledge acquisition. This is not going to be perfect, but it is, um, well, probably as much learning will happen here as they will get out of your lecture. Uh, I'll just say this is pretty typical of my classes now, where pretty much all the students are quizzing to mastery before class. 
Uh, I do this in my online classes. I also do it in my face-to-face -face classes. If you're going to lecture and you absolutely need to lecture, uh, another lesson from online learning is why not just video record your lectures? Um, they can watch them anywhere. They can watch them anytime. They can rewind. They can pause. Um, that should not say reply. Oh, they, they could reply because they could leave uh, comments. Um, there are probably, if you're using YouTube, it's going to create captions. They're not uh, ADA compliant yet, but YouTube's captions that it automatically creates are extremely accurate. And so since this is a YouTube, um, turn on the captions and see how good a job YouTube's artificial intelligence is doing transcribing what I'm saying as I'm saying it. And this is universal design. You could rewatch this. Um, if it's intriguing, you could rewind back and watch parts again. You could download the transcript and read it. You could listen to it while you're driving. Um, I could chunk this into seven parts, make each part into a small video, add those parts to an online quiz, ask students to watch 12 minutes and then answer a question. I'm going to call that a guided thinking activity. Um, there's actually quite a bit of research that some students will actually watch online lectures. And in as much as an online lecture is a continuous exposition by the teacher, it's the most efficient way to transmit knowledge. If you think this is a good lecture, I couldn't have done it better live. In fact, um, I can lecture perfectly with nobody here. There's no give and take, there's no interaction, but I'm hoping we do that part later. Well, what about lecture of storytelling, right? We have this power of storytelling. I'm working with an anthropology colleague and she's talking about the power of storytelling, the oral transmission of stories going back far into human prehistory. Um, you know, we've only been writing things and um, learning by writing for hundreds of years or maybe a few thousand years at best, where we've been, you know, this oral culture goes back tens of thousands of years or longer. Um, clearly, storytelling is powerful. Um, and a good storyteller is captivating and inspiring and amazing. And so we tell stories because we think it'll help students learn or care about our material. Stories weave in examples and anecdotes and stories make connections and they demonstrate our expertise and we go deeper into the material and we hope students are inspired to care and to learn. And, you know, there may be other reasons why we're telling stories, but I'm trying to capture some of that coolness and amazingness that can happen with a good storyteller and maybe what we want out of that story that we tell in class. And so, I don't know about this, but are you a storyteller? Do you think stories are a powerful learning tool that should be used in class? Um, Bly says, not so much. And again, I'm looking for criticisms here. Uh, I like stories too. But he says, if you're interested in getting students to be inspired to care about the course content, Bly at least didn't, found, didn't find any studies that showed lectures did this. He wasn't really looking at storytelling, but he actually did find 15 studies that showed lectures to be less effective than something else about inspiring students to care about the course. And so I guess if you're lecturing, the question you have to ask yourself is, why am I doing it? And so if it's about the content, I'm not sure this makes sense. If it's about inspiring students, I'm not sure. Um, I guess I'm just not sure why we're telling stories. Um, it really does demonstrate your mastery with the content and skills. And I guess one thing I'm stuck on is, man, the best stories are very unlectural like I mean, so to go back here to, to Bly, I don't know why we would expect a straightforward lecture to be inspiring because by definition a lecture is this didactic straightforward coverage of facts that is intentionally simple supposed to be understood by everybody where stories that are good are often very different than that right they're intellectually challenging they're ambiguous they're mysterious they leave things open um, you know often there's a moral or a point that's kind of left unstated um, and one thing you have to wonder is, will students actually get the point? 
um, if there's a moral or a point to your story, will they actually get it? Um, and I guess, again, why are you telling a story? If it's to cover content, obviously there's a more straightforward way to do that. Um, and so if your story's meant to cover content, it's going to end up being very boring and didactic. And so, again, I think there's a tension between the inspirational goal of storytelling versus the transmission of knowledge goal of storytelling. Um, you know, we really want students to create their stories. Um, that's the student doing the work, right? Um, we can tell these awesome stories that, that are related to our content because we own that content so well. Um, can we help students tell stories? That would really be a way for them to demonstrate their learning. Um, how about another reason? Lectures are orderly and predictable, and lectures help us keep an orderly and predictable class. Um, I think this is a reason that will resonate with some of you. If there are new teachers in here, I can almost guarantee this resonates with you as a new teacher going back to more than 25 years. Man, this is definitely a reason I wanted tightly scripted lectures because I was really worried that I didn't know what I was doing and I wouldn't be able to control the class and they were going to see me as frauds. And I just wanted things to be predictable and so I would know what's going on and I would seem in control. And so if I just plan everything really carefully, nothing bad will happen. Um, I'm just going to say that there's some truth to that. I, I, I think I'm in a bind because encouraging someone to lecture as a way to control the class seems to be in somewhat inauthentic a way to control the class because it kind of caters to that power differential. And my work in equity, which I am not an expert on at all, just lets me know that that power dynamic in class, even though it might protect us, may also have some really negative um, connotations in the classroom. Um, I think it's true. It can give you a sense of stability and comfort and control. I'm going to encourage you to risk feeling out of control. Um, easier said than done. But we may also, let's move on from that. Um, I think we may also lecture because we think that's what students want and need. Um, they expect lectures. That's probably true because they're part of this current paradigm too. They've mostly been exposed to lectures. That's probably what they're expecting. They may say they prefer lectures, and I've definitely heard my colleagues say that's, a, that's what students prefer. Some of them even say they enjoy lectures. I'm not sure about that. Um, but they may prefer lectures to other things that they want to do even less, like work in groups or be put on the spot to speak in class or present or do those kinds of things. And so I don't know how well these reasons are resonating with you. Um, we lecture because that's what students want or need. Um, well, Gibbs is citing the Hale Report, which was from the late 60s, and the Hale Report cited ratings of seven teaching methods, and of those seven, lectures were ranked last for efficiency, fifth out of seven for enjoyment, but first for frequency. And so this was at least one study that actually looked at students' preferences, and in this case, um, lectures were the most common. Um, but only fifth out of seven for enjoyment. And McLeish from 1970, who was also quoted by Gibbs, reported uh, a distaste for lectures in all groups of students from 10 colleges of education. This was in the UK. Um, now, a variety of other methods were well liked. Lectures, not so much. And I guess from me to you, um, this is a quote from me, what students prefer may or may not have any correlation to what's best for them in terms of learning. Uh, I have simply learned from my own students that what they prefer may have nothing to do with what's good for them. Um, it is extremely likely that students are going to prefer what is easy. And what I know from the science of learning is learning is best when it's not easy. If you're not struggling, you're not learning very much. And so um, one reason students like lectures is it doesn't ask much, if anything, of them. What they like may be antithetical to what is good for them. And so it is on us, I think, as the teachers and course designers 
to not cater to students' whims, but to actually design classes that help them learn. Uh, is it the case that students might push back? Possibly. Although I'll say in my experience that is not likely to happen once students realize that you're not lecturing because you know that it's not going to help them learn. Uh, maybe you want to point out to them that what's easiest may not actually help them learn. Something one of my students wrote um, last week on an assignment. Um, they were actually writing about their experiences in school and one of my students wrote this. She says, what's the worst thing about school? Having to sit from early in the morning to late in the afternoon hearing lecture after lecture. After a while they begin to bleed together and you're studying harder each night just so you can doodle through a lecture. I mean, she's really getting that. Where's the hard work done and where's the easy work done? And she's, she's you know, kind of tipping her hat even though she's not doing it explicit, explicitly to this power dynamic. It's completely one-sided creating a great divide between students and the knowledge they're trying to absorb. The teacher has it and I'm going to give it out to my students. So um, this was actually a very common sentiment in my class. When I actually asked students to reflect on lectures and learning, almost all of them said that lectures were not something they really enjoyed. Um, I've done a lot of studying of the science of learning over the last five years and there's a host of other reasons not to lecture and mainly because lectures simply don't attend to the way our brains actually learn. Um, learning is actually happening in your brain. It's a physical process of neurons forming and growing and connecting. And um, that requires recall practice and making connections. And again, I could put that Terry Doyle quote up. Um, well, what drives learning is hard work. And lectures require hard work on your part, but not so much on the students' parts. And so if you want some evidence that active learning, right, getting students to do the work will help them learn, there's a whole bunch out there. And I am happy to talk to you outside of this um, you know, presentation if you want access to some of these meta-analyses. These are two done in the early 2000s, one in 2004 and one in 2006. Um, each of these um, research articles looked at hundreds of uh, research studies in learning and they both offer evidence that active learning works. And here I'm just counterposing active learning from lecturing. It's not quite that simple, but active learning works. If you want your students to learn, moving away from lectures is a good idea. Well, so why are we lecturing? Well, because that's all we know. Uh, designing and developing uh, learning activities that are not based on lectures, it requires knowledge and skills that you don't have. Maybe that's one of the reasons you're here, to get some of those not, that knowledge so then you can start developing some new skills. I hope you are here for that reason. Um, is this you? Is this, you know, are you a, a novice or somewhat ignorant about alternatives? Um, I mean, I think it's true. In my experience, few college teachers have any training in course design. Most of us um, spent many years learning what to teach, but zero years learning how to teach it, unless we count uh, the modeling that we got in school or maybe the practice we got in grad school, assuming we got, we got any practice. Uh, or we got practice, assuming we got any feedback. Um, and there is a lot of research out there, and it's been around for 50 years or at least, or if not more, um, there's a lot of evidence that the science of learning tells us that lecturing isn't good, but most of us have not kept up with the science of learning. And so lecture is all we know. And so again, if this is you or not, you can certainly ponder that. Um, I'm a big John Dewey fan. I would just point mainly at the date of this quote, 1916. And just realize that people have been pushing back against the knowledge transmission paradigm for more than 100 years. I mean, we saw um, <laughs> uh, we saw that Sam, the Samuel Johnson quotes so from the seven, middle 1700s. So clearly people have been doing it for longer. But I love this Dewey quote. Uh, I will not be able to I'll try to read it accurately and give it, give, give it some of that voice. Why is it that in spite of the fact that teaching by pouring in 
learning by passive absorption are universally condemned, that they are still so entrenched in practice. That education is not an affair of telling and being told, but an active constructive process is a principle almost as generally violated in practice as conceded in theory. Is not this deplorable situation due to the fact that the doctrine is itself merely told? Well, in that first part, um, he thinks it's common sense that lecturing is not a good way for students to learn. And he thinks that was common sense more than 100 years ago. So why the heck are we sitting here now taught, having this conversation? But I think he's right, clearly here. We may have been talking about it and hearing it, but we haven't actually learned the skills to implement anything different. Um, here's my challenge. I want you to do something with what you've just heard in the last hour and five minutes. I can almost guarantee that if you leave after finishing, you know, I've got a couple more slides to cover, a, couple, a little bit more content to get through. If you leave and don't do anything with this, you're going to forget 95 to 90 percent of everything. Maybe you'll remember that Terry Doyle quote, the person who does the work does the learning, and that's great. Um, but if you actually want to make the most out of the time you just spent this last more than an hour, you're going to need to actually do something. And so I am really encouraging you right now to follow up with me with an email, to make a promise to yourself to move away from lectures, to try something different in your class, uh, to let me know how hard it is, to reach out to me in my email, um, you know, something. Complain to me, uh, engage with me, I'll push you, set a goal and try to get there. Um, if you just leave and don't do something with this, then I won't say it'll be completely a waste, but, um, you know, I enjoyed myself, if nothing else. So how do you move away from lecturing? Uh, it's not easy. I want you to move from this knowledge transmission paradigm over to the active learning paradigm. Uh, and I guess I'm here to tell you that uh, I don't think you can change part of a paradigm. Paradigms are all or nothing. They're holistic. I mean, that's why they're so powerful. Um, I'm not saying you're going to jump from being a lecturer to a master active learning facilitator. I guess what I'm asking you to do is to take a risk and jump from something that you're probably good at and that no one complains, even if it might not be driving learning as much as you want, something that you're confident at, you're good at, your students accept, um, and jump over to the other paradigm and be bad at it. Um, that's a lot to ask because I'm asking you to try to employ new skills, being a learner facilitator, um, and to take a risk and maybe have classes that don't go so well and to let up on the control a little bit. Um, I don't mean you have to give up all your lectures, but even giving up a little bit is going to be trying something new. And I'm giving you license to try. Uh, it's, maybe that's easy for me to do as your instructional coach, right? Someone who's just here helping you. Um, but I've been trying this for four or five years now. And in my online classes, I'm pretty good at it. In my face-to-face -face classes, I am still a recovering lecturer. I, I'm considering myself part of the new paradigm. I don't think lectures are the way to go. I'm, I'm telling myself not to do it. I tell my students we're in an active learning class and I fall back on lecturing way too much. Um, I am still a novice active learning facilitator, but I think my students are still learning more than they were when I was a good lecturer. How do you move away? Whether you want to move a little ways away or all the way away, you've got a plan and design. Um, that's a picture of the Oregon Trail. Ruts are deep and they last forever, or if not forever, a long time. Um, the pull of the knowledge transmission paradigm is like um, a black hole. It is extremely hard to break away from. Um, there are so many factors pulling you back to that sage on the stage. And we've talked about a lot of them. You know, just rewind since you can. Um, keep trying. And I'll just let you know that what, something we do here at Front Range Community College is we have something called the Active Learning Institute, where we really ask people to devote an entire year or more to this an entire semester learning about active learning, and one element of that is talking about lectures, and then to redesign a class completely from the ground up, and then to teach that class with help from a coach, 
Um, I can't offer all of that to you, but I can just tell you that you've got to plan as much as you can. Um, tell students why you're doing it. I want to help you learn. I know we're comfortable in the lecture world. I'm going to push us both to be uncomfortable, and I'm doing it because it's grounded in research. And they'll, they'll come along with you. Find mentors on your campus. Find supporters. Find other people that are doing it. Uh, get a partner, a buddy, you know, someone who is not your supervisor, especially if your supervisor isn't a champion of you taking a risk. Um, I'll be your champion out here. Email me. Um, find someone to talk to when things don't go well, um, which there'll be times when they won't because you're going to be trying th new things. Um, don't give up. Try it. Fail. Try again. Um, change is hard for you and your students. Praise them when they're struggling and working hard. Um, I'm just going to offer you a few ideas on maybe how to start making this transition. Reach out to me if you want more. I have a lot more. I think you want to frame this on how do you design a class where you want to put yourself in the role of the facilitator and make students do the work of learning. One thing you can do is just stop lecturing once in a while. Um, just stop lecturing. If you are a continuous exposition person, just stop and ask students questions have them do something once in a while. Um, even this alone has been shown to have a positive impact on student learning in some of that research that I read. Um, if you want a chance to create a teachable moment where you can actually intervene and help a student learn, um, you've got to create it. They might happen spontaneously, but if you want these teachable moments where you can actually do something other than lecture, you've got to design them into your class. If you want a chance to push the student toward learning, then set up a situation where you're watching their learning in progress. It could be for during homework, you know, and then you're looking at what they did before class. And then you're able to go in and actually intervene, not with a lecture, but with just-in-time teaching. Or they're doing something in class and you're watching them struggle and learn and letting them have productive struggle and then you're there to help them before the struggle gets too much. Um, it's all about the setup. You want to make sure that every part of your class is there for a reason. So the work students are doing outside of class is setting them up for something that's going to happen in class. And if you can actually intervene here by looking at their work because they submitted it into your learning management system before class. Um, and then maybe they're doing something, um, sorry, uh, in class that's going to set them up to go out of class and do some work. And then they're going to see, this is why uh, Eric's asking me to do homework, right? Because he's telling me to do something that's tied directly to my learning and it's segueing me from class to my independent work where I'm going to do a lot of hard work and I'm going to come back in class and do something meaningful. Um, Think about everything as setting students up to learn and setting yourself up to create teachable moments. This is the kind of lecture that I think fits most squarely inside the active learning paradigm. It is just-in-time teaching. We're allowing students to struggle. They're trying to grapple with the content on their own. Maybe they're doing an activity and or a quiz. And then they're doing some kind of a formative assessment that you're looking at and intervening, and then what are you doing? You're doing something harder than rote lecture, and you're actually doing this dynamic thing that requires even more of you as a content expert and a skilled person in your field. You're giving them just the intervention that they need based on the work that they've already done. Um, this is amazing, and I will just tell you that the gratification I get now from doing this kind of lecturing um, is way more than those awesome PowerPoints I used to have. Um, you know, this is the new lecture, I'm putting scare quotes around that, in the active learning paradigm. Um, again, I'm going to give Quizzing to Mastery another shout out. I think all of you could import a Quizzing to Mastery scheme into your classes, and if you do nothing else, this would allow you to lecture less because you could review the quiz before class. You could see the questions they struggled with the most. You could focus on them. You could have them do an activity on the quiz. Um, you could also just have them come to class and cover the content. Um, this is an actual picture from a nursing uh, class uh, at my college. 
And I loved sitting on this class because I got to see a teacher being a learner facilitator. Um, she was not lecturing. This was a three hour nursing class and she had given students meaningful homework. There were online lectures for them to watch and they came to class and generated content. And other students then were vetting the things they were writing, adding on to it. This was an amazing class where the teacher was facilitating learning. She was doing just-in-time teaching both at the board. She was walking around in the audience. After the board was full of stuff, they did a separate activity. Um, it was really cool. Now, students can only do this because she had managed to convince them to do their due diligence outside of class. Um, you could do something uh, that Dr. Mazur calls peer instruction. Um, I mean, more or less, what does he do? He gives students a problem. He uses clickers. He lets them click in their answers. Um, if, if students' answers are very dichotomous, if they're torn between two or three answers, he puts them in groups in a big lecture hall, makes them talk about it, brainstorm, talk about their answers, lets them answer again. Maybe they get closer to the truth. He puts them back in groups, lets them struggle. He does some just-in-time lecturing. I mean, you can go on YouTube and watch him in action. He calls it peer instruction. He is still driving the class. He designed the class. He came up with the problems. He lets them struggle for a while, not too long. Follows up with some just-in-time teaching. He's still really not lecturing. He's pushing them to think further. I mean, after all, these are pre-med students at Harvard. He's expecting a lot of them. Um, watch um, some Dr. Mazur videos if you want to. Um, I love the Freyer model. There are a host of in-class activities that you could use to either replace a lecture, to give you information that will let you, let you follow up with a just-in-time lecture. Um, this is really an activity that students are probably working outside of class on the content. They're going to come into class, work individually on something like this. So maybe I ask students to read and study active learning, then they're going to come into class, generate this alone. Then maybe they're going to go in small groups and talk about it. Maybe they're going to present out. And then if I were the teacher, I would be facilitating these small groups, letting students struggle, picking out mistakes they're making. And I might follow up with a 10 minute lecture talking about things that I liked, I didn't like, what worked, what didn't work, all kinds of things that you can build off of a Freer model. Um, you know, um, and there are so many other ideas out there. Um, one place you might want to look, uh, I quoted from both of these books, um, and certainly I you know, can talk about lots more resources for you if you want them. Uh, if you want more ideas to just what could you do in class other than lecture, um, this is a great book. But there are a ton of books about class activities. Uh, I've also done other presentations on active learning and all kinds of other things if you want to talk to me more about this. Um, thank you very much. This was almost an hour and 20 minutes, so I hopefully transmitted a ton of content to you. Um, I hope you take me up on my challenge and think about it. Reach out to me, set a goal for yourself, and then let me know how far you go in achieving that goal. Um, again, let's see if I can actually come back live. If you're still watching me, maybe I can. Uh, well, maybe not. Um, thanks, everybody.